<laughs> All right, there's uh, no uh, big video. There's no enormous fanfare, no marching band. It's just me, Jeff Bull, and I say welcome to you. Welcome to this year's Liberal Arts and Science Conference. What's next? Now, whether you're a member of the LAS faculty or one of those dreadful management figures, I'm um, just kidding, of course, or even if you're coming here from outside Humber, we're very glad to see you here tonight. I uh, should also acknowledge that Humber College is located on the traditional territories of the Ojibwe Anishinaabe First Nations people. This site is part of the Humber River watershed, which historically provided an integral connection for Aboriginal peoples between the Ontario Lakeshore and the Lake Simcoe Georgian Bay region. Before we begin, I have a few uh, heartfelt thanks, and they really are sincere. So no laughing. Okay. Uh, to all the members of this year's organizing committee, whose names you will see listed on the back of our program, I'd like to say uh, thank you very much, whether it was by vetting submissions or helping plan the sessions or organizing the venues and the refreshments or otherwise involving yourself in getting this show on the road. Once again, I want to let you know that you have done me and the school a solid, as Jerry's friend Kramer liked to say. We won't talk about the other stuff, he said. We'll just talk about that. All right. Uh, to Paul Gouveia, to Melanie Sparks, Vanya Valenzuela, Arl Viaj, and everyone else in the LAS offices who saw to it that the money went where it was supposed to go, the loot got bagged, the websites were refreshed. Uh, we will never forget your kindness in doing that. Thank you very much. And your patience, too. We had to change that website again and again and again. So thank you. I'd like to thank our sponsors as well, including Linnea Nord from Nelson, the School of Liberal Arts and Sciences, the Office of the Dean of Research, and the Center for Teaching and Learning. We appreciate you helping us again to stage this event and provide the funds in order to provide our excellent keynote speaker tonight. And I'd also like to say hi and thank you to all the members of uh, Humber's AV crew who set this room up so skillfully, as well as all the people working here and in the Humber room today and tomorrow who are going to feed and comfort us so well. So thank you very much. Okay, a couple of housekeeping things first. First, the draw. We will now announce the winner of the prize, which is an autographed copy of Sean McAuliffe's book, Frontier City, which we're going to be hearing a little bit about in a minute. This is completely on the up and up. Those 15 with my name in them, or my name on them, they're not going to get picked. It's okay. It doesn't work that way. And the winner is uh, Euphemia Fantanetti. That's a good time for me to remind you, too, that we have copies of Sean's book available in the Humber Bookstore. So if you are interested in what you hear tonight, you can easily obtain a copy from there uh, in the immediate future or sometime uh, distant from now, which we won't talk about either. But uh, it's a really good book. I read it recently myself, and I can tell you it's well worth it. So I'd also like to uh, mention to all participants in tomorrow's sessions that we will have coffee and breakfast type stuff here in the seventh semester starting at 8.30 in the morning. So between 8.30 and 9.30, if you come in, you have a chance to uh, get charged up. And then the panels will begin at 9.30. All of them will take place in the D building. And I'll remind you that lunch will be in the Humber Room. So please check the program for particulars of that sort. All right, so now uh, my little introduction. When this college started 50 years ago, Many people, I suspect, thought that it was quite a ways out of town. Toronto was somewhere down there by the lake. This was a hinterland site like Scarberia or Lastman's Mysterious Sanctum of North York. Legend has it, for example, that faculty would wait for cattle to pass before they could get into the parking lot. But since then, of course, Toronto has grown it's grown out, in fact, to hug this place close. And Humber, in turn, has tried to make itself, if you will, huggable. That is, to make itself a factor in the growth and success, not just of many thousands of Toronto and area students, but of the city entire. Uh, it's this growth and interconnection, how it happened, what it means, why it will matter for generations ahead, that has long been the fascination of our keynote speaker tonight, Sean McAuliffe. For example, in his recent book, Frontier City, Toronto on the Verge of Greatness, again, I mentioned it is for sale in the Humber Bookstore, 
He traces the real and imagined lines of connection and division in our so-called megacity, offering new ways to consider what we could become. Drawing on interviews with citizen activists and his own experiences as an honest witness to those interesting years of Rob Ford's mayoralty, Mr. McAuliffe gives all sides of the debate over Toronto's future their fair say. He also does a great job, I should mention, of showing you how much of this town you can see from your bike. And also, how much we miss when we stick too carefully to the villages that we tend to claim amongst the city streets. I always remember talking with my wife once when we realized if you drew a map of where we went in Toronto, you would have these little narrow bands and nothing else. And so we have been trying to get out and see, and I was so thrilled to see Sean offer so many great ideas for places to go you would never think to go that have a lot to offer in the city. So I can think of no one better able to stir our thinking about what's next for the city, and that's why I'm delighted that he's agreed to join us tonight. Ladies and gentlemen, Sean McAuliffe. Hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, thanks for having me, actually, too. Uh, because we're intimate, uh, if, if, uh, if you feel like jumping in and like, like yelling at me if I say something offensive or a question or anything like that, please do. Um, or if you need a drink or, or a decorative gourd, please go up and get it. Um, so what's next is a fun um, title, uh, kind of fun concept to, to talk about, and also a bit daunting, because part of me is like, I have no idea. Like, the, I could not have predicted six years ago how weirdly roller coastery Toronto would have gone. If you can imagine 2008, Obama was just elected, David Miller was still um, mayor here, uh, an LRT was planned to open in 2013 here at Humber College. That would have taken you to Finch, uh, Finch and, um, uh, that, that other subway line, um, and, then, and then other things happened. Um, so I think what I'm going to talk about is, uh, is, is the book first, because that's kind of a, a way into the past and the future, and then just some general uh, reasons why I really think cities, and Toronto still, too, uh, are exciting places. So this book came around uh, back in 2014, and if you can kind of go back to 2014, um, there was uh, Rob Ford doing uh, this sort of thing, uh, going on Jimmy Kimmel. Uh, there was all the high drama of um, BBC and uh, CNN trucks outside of City Hall um, and kind of waiting breathlessly for the next uh, crazy thing that was going to happen. It's almost, um, in writing this book, I had to go back and read a lot of news reports because it almost seemed like fiction. Because if you wrote a fictional story like that, it would be too much. Um, so it was pitched to me as a, a, in 2014 by my publishers, and, and they really wanted to jump on the Rob Ford train, the, the, the non-gravy train of Rob Ford, uh, because they had to capitalize on that. Um, and it, it became immediately clear to me that um, that drama, the kind of the cocaine, the, the kind of tragedy of Rob Ford, which was a tragedy, uh, as well as his politics, um, was not the interesting part. That part was going to get reported out. It was, what was it about this city that elected a guy like that? We have, we have four colleges, we have four universities. You know, it's a very smart city of endless panel discussions and uh, uh, concept, tons of books about the city, uh, people studying this place, lots of uh, civil uh, society organizations um, trying to help this place out, yet it elected Rob Ford. Um, so I went backwards as my slide is going backwards a bit, um, to 2010. And I accidentally went to an early Ford Fest. Um, so this is in Rob Ford's mom's backyard, um, which some of you may have been here if you've been there, if you've been to a, a Ford Fest, because they invited people into their inner sanctum. You know, like a backyard's an intimate space. Uh, there, were, there were pools, uh, fountains, there were cupids kind of peeing in the pools. It was like, you know, it was like a Canadian backyard, a big one though. Um, and there were 3,000 people in it. And a friend of mine and I were like joking on a Friday night, let's go to Ford Fest, because uh, we, we both wrote about the city, kind of paid a lot of attention to City Hall. And that jokey um, city councillor who says all the, 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 the weird things, the funny things, the offensive things from the corner of the city is running for mayor. This is going to be a funny Friday night. So as we drove up Royal York, um, into Etobicoke towards his mom's house, there was this intense traffic jam. Uh, and we had to park in the, uh, the, like the last spot across the, uh, across the road in the strip mall. 
and it felt like we were going to Woodstock. Like there was, there was hundreds of people walking along the street and kids with Ford Nation shirts, holding signs, directing traffic, uh, directing people in. And it was like this um, pilgrimage to his mom's backyard. And as we rounded the, the side of the house, uh, this, I, I snapped this picture because Rob Ford had just taken the stage um, to Eye of the Tiger. Uh, and, 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 and started saying all the Rob Ford things that we became quite used to. Um, and I almost like had goosebumps at that moment because it's like, okay, this is a real thing. This is not what I was expecting. This, this seems to have come out of nowhere. Um, how, come I, how come I missed it? And how come we all thought it was a joke? Um, so I went back to that and, and started thinking about um, what was it about this place? Uh, that, that, that elected Rob Ford. And I think a lot of people who are in, in the media paying attention to City Hall uh, tended to focus on this part, right? The downtown part, uh, the, the place where you can kind of walk over to City Hall or take a bike lane down to City Hall. Well, I don't think you can take a bike lane to City Hall. Uh, not yet, anyway, maybe in 20 years. Um, but, uh, but it tends to uh, realize quickly that uh, the focus was really narrow in Toronto. But Toronto goes and goes. And, and you, know, you, you all teach here at Humber. Um, so you know how big it is. Uh, a lot of people don't know how big it is when you live downtown. Maybe you come in and out to the airport or, or, or to the cottage and that sort of thing. Um, and uh, I, in, in chatting with people uh, about Rob Ford, about where he was from, I realized people had no idea the, the, the actual geography of the place. And when you get out really far, this is over Scarborough, uh, over the uh, Gatineau Hydro Corridor, uh, just like on this side, you know, City Hall's about 25 kilometers away and it looks like a little uh, toothpick, right? Whereas for a lot of people in the, in, in kind of uh, City Hall government, civil society, the, C the CN Tower is the dominant thing on the landscape. Um, but for a lot of Torontonian, it's not. Um, so I wanted to get down onto the sidewalk of these parts of Toronto, the parts that have been overlooked, that I overlooked. Um, and so I decided to go for walks with city council candidates. Um, Toronto has 44 f wards um, spread out all across the city, obviously, um, but the mayor's race sucks up all the oxygen in, in uh, election year. You'll see it happen in 2018, too. Um, yet every one of these wards has their own um, dynamics and tensions and drama, um, as well as the geography of the place. So in poking around uh, general media reports, and as well as on Twitter, Twitter was very helpful, because all politicians have Twitter, and I tried to find um, people that kind of were talking about interesting city building stuff, but were coming from different places, uh, not the usual, you know, south of Bloor, between the Don Valley and uh, Hyde Park kind of space. Um, and I started uh, actually two blocks from here, uh, just across Humber Boulevard uh, on the northwest side of the campus here. And I went for a walk with Idil Barali. She was running in Ward 1. Um, and uh, she, we, we met on uh, Folks Crescent, uh, F F. O-L-K-E-S, which is just over here. Um, short little street, and she wanted to show me the street sign that had taken weeks and weeks to get replaced. It had been stolen or something. Some punks took it. Um, and, she w and, and then she wanted to show me the potholes. She said, politics is potholes. It's about, it's about these daily life things that sometimes get overlooked when we're talking about the bigger, higher level uh, city things. So we walked all around the ward. We actually drove to different places in the ward and then went for walks. Uh, this is Panorama Court uh, in Rexdale. What you realize is the, uh, the wards that are farther out of the center uh, are really big. A downtown councillor could probably walk across their ward in 15 minutes, some of like the, you know, the Trinity Spadina areas. Uh, whereas out here, uh, the, the space is so vast and I think a lot of people don't uh, actually grasp that. Um, so she was the first one I walked with, and uh, it seemed like a good thing to do, so I kept walking, finding new candidates and walking with them. And um, over on the other side of the city, kind of the last ward of, of Toronto, or the first ward, depending how you want to look at it, in Ward 44, right on the Pickering border, uh, I found uh, Amarjeet, and she was running um, against a longtime sitting uh, city councillor who has since passed away. And she wanted to meet me at a sewage tr treatment plant. Um, the, uh, the, the Highland Creek sewage treatment facility because there's an issue in the, uh, the ward of them trucking out solid waste. 
Um, and that sounded good. You know, we all have uh, we all have a stake in sewage. You know, we're all uh, contributing to it. So we, I met her out front of the sewage plant, and it's really interesting walking with politicians because they they have no fear. And she just like marched in the front gate, and I was saying, no, we're not supposed to do this. And she was and she was just marching because she wanted to show me the plant. And inevitably, a guy in an orange vest came up and, and kind of kicked us out. Um, but that was like another realization that um, all these politicians or would be politicians running for city council um, have all this endless energy and determination to uh, get into the, their communities um, that, that goes well beyond the mayoral race that gets all the attention. Um, and then we walk down uh, a few blocks away from the sewage treatment plant to the really beautiful, uh, like the Riviera of Scarborough. Um, so as I walk with people, uh, the, the issues came out, these kind of very local issues that people cared a lot about. They were often had to do with service delivery, fixing potholes, fixing signs, getting leaves picked up. Not the, not the bike lanes and all the other things that we were worried about uh, in, in our kind of more downtown wards. Um, so the issues came out, but also the, the general beauty and all these hidden gems of Toronto um, were, were kind of mixed into it. Uh, so the book I tried to weave, weave both those issues, the problems that we're facing, as well as why this is kind of a really neat place to live in. Um, another woman I walked with was uh, Mary Hine. She was about 72, and she was running, uh, this is in the Don Valley, um, just south of the 401. Uh, and she's running against, uh, she was running against Denzel Minh and Wong in 2014. Uh, he's one of the mayor's uh, deputies. Um, the guy who really hates bike lanes and he's always kind of meddling in downtown things. You've probably seen him. Uh, for downtown, uh, downtown elites or whatever they are, uh, he's kind of like the, the goblin, the guy that, you know, kind of like the evil uh, genius or non-genius, however you look at him. And then th this woman who had nobody working with her, maybe she had one or two volunteers every now and then, uh, was running against them, and I went for a walk with her, and she had all these, s a stack of hand, uh, hand photocopied uh, flyers, and we just went uh, to house to house. Nobody answered the doors, uh, and she dropped the leaflet through the through the slot, and it was like 28, 29 degrees that day, and it was raining a little bit, and she trudged on, and it, I realized how much work it is to run for uh, city council. Um, all these people basically take off a year of their life if they want to actually run for city council. Um, and they don't get paid. Uh, you can raise a certain amount of money. Most of them joke that you, you lose actually $30,000 or $40,000 to run for city council in opportunity cost. Um, but then we went to the top of her co-op here where she uh, had worked to get a community garden on top of the co-op. This is at Don Mills Road in the 401. Uh, and again, you see how beautiful uh, and lush Toronto is. Uh, I walked with a TDSB candidate, uh, this is Parthi, uh, who is in the south part of uh, Ward 18, south part of uh, Scarborough. Uh, the thing about the TDSB, the school board, is it's two wards of, of city council put together. So there are these massive wards of 100,000 people for this um, even kind of more distant level of democracy. Uh, people don't pay attention to city council very much. You know, you get federal, gets all the attention, provincial gets all the attention, and then city council a little bit has the lowest um, voter turnout. TD, uh, school boards get the least amount, right? And, and yet they have, and, and they have the smallest budget, and then they have this vast space and population, and they can hardly talk to anyone in, in the ward. Um, this is one of the only candidates I walked with of the 12 I walked with that won. I think uh, two people won. All, all my candidates were um, um, losers uh, in the election, but great people otherwise. Uh, but I wanted to find people who were underdogs. I didn't want to go with the incumbent because the incumbents are trying to preserve power, whereas the, the underdogs, um, they're critiquing power, looking at power from below. Um, so they have this really interesting perspective. Um, and we walked with, I walked with Parthi uh, through a, a Toronto community housing building right on Kingston Road, just up a little path from the, uh, the bluffs here. And he was doing his door knocking. And um, it was interesting watching him because it was like a little performance every two minutes or so because he would have to, I, I would see him like almost like an actor building himself up, building the energy up because he doesn't know what's going to happen. Like it's, it's like improv because that person might be hostile, they might be friendly, they might slam the door, they might want to talk for 10 minutes, but he had to be ready for it. And then once it's over with, he has to go next door and build it up again. And it was just a roller coaster of energy and then, and then valley, energy valley, energy valley. I realized I could never do this. These people um, have, have something else. 
Um, and, and anyway, we, we, there was a door that was ajar, and uh, Parthi knocked on it, and uh, a, a voice said, don't come in, it's the bed bugs. And we could see uh, everything was bagged in garbage bags, and we never saw the woman. She says, just leave what you're, and there's a little desk by the door, um, and don't come in. We could smell the smell coming out of the, the building. Um, so we kind of saw what, you know, what is sort of abstract. We hear about these things, but to actually see it, smell it, uh, is a whole other thing. Um, and there's buildings full of this kind of uh, life, um, this kind of uh, way of life uh, in Toronto. And then you walk 200 meters away, and then you're in this beautiful spot. Um, and so the, the beauty and the, and, the, and the tragedy of Toronto are almost right next door to each other. And often the tragedy of Toronto is hidden away in these buildings, uh, tucked away. Um, the, uh, the problems of Toronto do not articulate themselves the way, you know, it's, it's not the wire. It's not like Baltimore, right? It's, it's all of Toronto kind of looks like either downtown Toronto or suburban Toronto, e either of those built forms, but it's hard to actually go through as you're driving through or, or on the TTC, um, you know, see what's bad and what's good. Um, the, you know, the, all the, 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 the social problems of Toronto are really tucked away, which kind of allows Torontonians to live in this illusion that everything's okay. Um, yeah, Scarborough Bluffs, yeah. This is like Kingston Road and um, like Cliffside. So not too far away from the, maybe three kilometers east of the filtration plant at the end of Queen Street. Um, I walked with this fellow named Paul Bocking. He was in a Scarborough uh, Ward, Ward 35, which is right on the border of Scarborough and what used to be uh, Toronto and East York. So we met at the corner of, uh, of uh, Victoria Park and Danforth. Uh, which I really like to meet there because it's it's like the three corners of three ancient cities, pre mega city of, of East York, Scarborough, and uh, Toronto, uh, all touching each other. And when you're on that corner, you can't tell what's Toronto downtown, and you can't tell what's Scarborough, you know, the suburbs. And during the 2014 election, all through all throughout the the four years, there was this uh, divide between downtown and suburbs, which you hear about and you still hear about. Um, which, which certainly had some uh, reality to it, but it was also cranked up by uh, pol certain politicians who um, benefited from that. Um, so it was really kind of fun to meet him there and, and, and write about that territory where you can't, like, if you had to draw a border, like a, a line between downtown and the suburbs, can you do it? Uh, I think a lot of people wouldn't be able to do it. And at that corner, for sure you can't. And then we walked deeper into Scarborough along uh, Danforth Road. Uh, after Danforth Avenue becomes road, and it kind of is like this Broadway uh, that goes off the grid. It just zigzags uh, uh, up north uh, east through Scarborough, like the way Broadway goes through Manhattan, um, but perhaps a little bit less romantic. And it goes by um, all kinds of strip malls, and then this is a strip mall uh, nearby on Eglinton Road in Scarborough. And, and when you're walking along the strip mall, there's some of my favorite places in Toronto, the ones out here in Rexdale, uh, North York, Scarborough. Uh, if you ignored the, the, the parking lot out front, it would be a, the kind of quintessential main street, mom and pops, very little change. You might see a Tim Hortons, there might be a, you know, a H and R block, there might be like a, a parasitic uh, money mart, but mostly it's all independent enterprises and a total jumble of them, which is wonderful. And, and they tend to be this kind of beautiful, heterogeneous mix. Um, and it's the, the rents out here are still ex Toronto expensive, but they're still cheaper than downtown where it's almost impossible for any independent person you know, to, to start up a business because the overhead is so high. That's why downtown on, on the streets, it kind of has this repeating landscape of of uh, almost like like the old cartoons like um, Scooby Doo, where the they didn't they didn't pay for a really big background, and so it repeats every like two seconds, and you see, keep seeing the same stuff go by. So the same Starbucks, same Grand and Toy, same Shoppers Drug Mart, Shoppers Drug Mart, um, and and but out here it's not like that. It it it, it ho holds the mystery of the city because you don't know what you're going to get every step of the way, um, because it, it, it's cheap enough that you can it, it allows for the startup stuff. Um, th this is all independent, uh, you know, the, the, the feral economy of Toronto. Uh, if this was downtown, if it was government funded, we'd probably call it a, um, uh, an incubator, an economic incubator, uh, but it just happens on its own. Um, so you get kind of like old school Toronto places next door to uh, all, all the mix that we have today. 
Um, and some places feel like total throwbacks to the 1950s in the strip malls. Other ones uh, have uh, feel like somewhere else, which is wonderful. And it all kind of happens on this landscape that a lot of people have overlooked because it has a parking lot in front. If you could drag them out to the street, uh, you'd have every urbanist drooling over them uh, around the world. But, but because of that parking lot, people tend to ignore them. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a very messy urbanism that I, I think Toronto embodies really well. Uh, but it is not a quintessential beautiful kind of city. Um, it's, it's, it's one that takes, uh, it takes, it takes, it takes a while to come around to it. You know, the way people walk, go to Paris or they go to Edinburgh or Prague, these cities that look like wedding cakes, you know, and it's like they instantly invite you to love me, I am beautiful, like these supermodel cities. Uh, Toronto's not a supermodel city. Uh, it, it, a lot of it looks like this, uh, but it's beautiful because of what the humans have done, I think. But it doesn't have that immediate affection that other places engender. I went for a walk with Alejandra Bravo. She was running in Ward 17, which is like Dufferin, St. Clair, Davenport area. Um, and she had an interesting way of talking about her neighborhood. Uh, she said it was the border between downtown and the suburbs because she had uh, uh, a contingent of, uh, you know, kind of lefty or center lefty bike riding, uh, organic market shopping, Portlandia kind of people, uh, and then a lot of Rob Ford voters uh, that existed there, a lot of uh, working class uh, uh, folks, uh, immigrant families uh, who, who were Ford supporters and really were, you know, uh, found uh, resonance in his message. So she negotiated that territory. It was her third time running, um, and, uh, and she lost uh, for the third time. And, and she uh, endured a, a ton of abuse. She got um, death threats, rape threats, had to call the police. Uh, and and I, I, can, I wrote about it in the book. Uh, she uh, talked about it a lot. And so it took a lot out of her, her, like there was one day they got these threats, she had to go get her kid out of school just to make sure uh, they were safe, right? And so th you know, these, are, these are individuals running for city council in Toronto and they're getting these kind of wild, horrible threats. Um, I went for a walk with, uh, Keegan Henry Matthew in Ward 7. Um, so this is uh, Jane and uh, Wilson. And, and he wanted to go for a walk through Chalk Farm. There's four really tall buildings, uh, TCHC buildings, uh, in the Chalk Farm neighborhood. And he talked about the issues there of, of uh, ceilings caving in and, and leaking bathrooms that don't work anymore uh, and bed bugs and, and it was overlooked. And he said other political people that he had talked to um, because he had a bit of help said, don't go through the buildings, those people don't vote. Um, and I kind of heard that over and over again that people in buildings, which so many Torontonians live, um, uh, often people, mostly often people of, of, of lower incomes are overlooked um, and, and, and dismissed. So there's almost no, there's almost built in no constituency uh, to, to support um, investing in these places. But he went through it and he, and he walked around it with me. Um, and so it's a kind of, it's also another strangely beautiful place because uh, there's Sheridan Mall, which is right at Wilson and Jane, which is kind of behind me here. And then there's this bridge that goes over Black Creek uh, and then it gets into the Chalk Farm neighborhood. And uh, Black Creek was beautiful. Under here, there were ducks uh, going up and down. Black Creek is a strange creek because sometimes it's natural like it is here. Sometimes it looks like the LA River because it's encased in concrete, which we don't do anymore. Um, but it has that kind of, uh, really abused and natural kind of feel to it. So it's a really beautiful setting as well. And there's forests and parks going all the way up. Uh, but again, hidden in these buildings, if you were driving by, is the, is the poverty and the, the issues that you don't see much about. Also in this ward, Keegan was running against uh, Giorgio Mammoliti, which uh, is one of those councillors that people who don't pay attention to city council may have heard of him because he's had now 25 years of antics, uh, whether it was running as an NDPer uh, in Bob Ray's government, or, or sorry, sitting in Bob Ray's government as an NDPer, or becoming a right-wing populist um, <laughs> in his new life uh, in, in city council, um, first before Megacity and then after. He's been, he's been in there since. Um, famously, in the early 2000s, he took off his shirt in city council, as you can see on the left, uh, to protest the Hamlin's Point becoming clothing optional. Um, and as you know, to p protest clothing optional things, you take off your clothes. Um, so he, he did stunts like that. And during Rob Ford, Rob Ford was his best frenemy. Like he, he uh, and Rob Ford had these historic battles in, in, in council where um, Ford called him a Geno boy and 
Mamaliti, who calls himself Mamo, uh, called him something else. And there were just these kind of epithets going back and forth. But then when Ford got into power, uh, Mamo is very attracted to power and kind of became his, his, his thuggish right-hand man. He sat right next to him at city council and put his thumb up and down and told people how to vote on each issue. So it was almost like he was, well, votes are not whipped in, in city council. Uh, everyone's an independent person. But he had this kind of intimidating theater, theatrical bit about him. It almost feels like the beginning of uh, Romeo and Juliet, where it's like, you bite your thumb at me, you know, and there's that kind of like posturing, that macho posturing, and he did that. Um, it was really interesting to go into city council meetings uh, at that time because the, um, the um, body language, uh, it still is like that, but with the Ford brothers, and when, when he was on a rip, uh, it, it was wild. It was the best theater around. Um, so he, he kind of ascended to this strange role um, this was him tweeting just yesterday. Um, he was tweeting at uh, Jennifer Pagliaro, who's a Toronto Star City uh, Hall writer. Um, and uh, this stuff doesn't matter, really. He, he discovered that he has 280 characters versus 240, because Twitter's expanding their, their, their length for some people. And so halfway through his rant, he got bigger. So he discovered he could go longer. Anyway, he, he said, bite me mammo style. I'm not going anywhere. So he's still like kind of t talking that way. Um, and Keegan was running against him. And we tried to figure out why, what was it about this ward um, that, that elected a guy like this who was a buffoon that everyone laughed at, just like Rob Ford was before uh, uh, up in Ward uh, 2. And it, 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 it went down to, um, well, there's a bunch of things, but often if someone had a good experience, if Giorgio Mammoliti fixed your fence or dealt with some issue that I called his office for, there was some garbage lying around, uh, people would vote for him and be kind of voters for life. Uh, which was a light bulb that went on for me as well, because uh, I got caught up in ideas and you know city building and like how are we going to make a great city, um, but that's not how a lot of people think. Um, I think they can be uh, uh, led into thinking about that, um, but it's really about what's going on on people's sidewalk and that and that. Uh, um, is downtown and the suburbs. So if Giorgio Mammoliti did something good for somebody, they voted for him. They've been voting for him for 20 years, despite, you know, taking his shirt off and being kind of the laughing stock. That part, that doesn't factor in. It factors into those of us who pay attention to City Hall because we think it's like the, f the it's, it's, it's part of the drama and, 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 and that sort of thing. But, but it, doesn't, it doesn't factor into how people vote. Uh, and then there's uh, Munira, uh, and she was running against uh, Rob Ford himself and Doug Ford uh, in Ward 2. And she grew up here. She wanted to show me this neighborhood. This is Dixon Road, the th six towers of Dixon Road, which you can kind of see from the airport. Um, and she talked about uh, there's nowhere, there's no community center in the area, which is another theme I kept hearing as I walked through Toronto with people. Um, the, uh, she showed me it was kind of like a relic. Um, Vince Carter uh, sponsored a, uh, a basketball court that was put in, I guess, 10 years ago um, when Vince Carter was here, or was it more? I don't watch the Raptors, but you can see the, the old Vince Carter logo on the, um, on the backboard. Um, and then she went up into the buildings where some of her relatives still live, and one of her aunts runs a uh, daycare out of the, uh, the apartment. They're big 1980s apartments, so you can fit like six cribs in it. So um, I had often heard about the hidden economy of towers, you know, people running businesses out of them. In the old days, uh, in the old days, in, in the kind of older city old days, if somebody wanted to run a business and then maybe they live on Dundas or Bathurst or Bloor, all these kind of streets that used to be residential, they'd bust out the front wall and build a little shop, you know, and they'd make shoes or they'd do whatever. Whereas now, you know, people live, uh, you know, working class folks, new Canadians often live in buildings. So the built form doesn't allow for that economy to flourish the way it used to do on the main streets of Toronto. Um, but it still happens in its own ways up and down. That's why the, the um, there's a thing called Tower Renewal, which a lot of you may have heard of, um, a program that started under David Miller, somehow survived the Rob Ford years, and still is uh, about to launch a couple pilot projects, um, wants to figure out ways to use that space around so many of the buildings in Toronto um, so people can do what they used to do you know, 50 years ago on Main Streets. And, and, and if, if they're good at something, if they have some sort of uh, social enterprise, all that sort of thing, they can make it happen uh, near their house. Um, so we walked through that. We walked, she talked about precarious employment. A lot of the kids uh, who live here work at the airport. You know, they take the, they take the Lawrence bus, which kind of goes nearby, get to the airport uh, for jobs, which are kind of 
good job to get, but she made the point that they're kind of dead end jobs. Um, they don't they don't lead anywhere. Um, but the airport, uh, because it's such a big uh, economic cluster, is is why a lot of people live there. Um, but but they get trapped in that. Um, this was also the territory where Rob Ford's drama played out. These were the towers that got raided in um, Project Traveler uh, during the kind of crack. Uh, smoking phase. It was one block north of here on Windsor Avenue where he, Rob Ford, was pictured uh, with, with the two guys in front of the garage, the one guy who was later shot and killed. Um, and so this was, this, and she talked a lot about the, 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 the kind of the damage that th those stories were doing to the neighborhood. It's a largely uh, Somali neighborhood in here and, and they were um, targeted. Uh, media would come in and ask them, you know, well, what's wrong with you? Like it was really kind of harsh. So she talked a lot about the collateral damage, the human collateral damage beyond Rob Ford himself, what was happening to the neighborhood where a lot of this played out. Um, and then she had to deal with, uh, she was running against Doug Ford first. Uh, this is 2014. And then Rob Ford got cancer. And so Rob and Doug did a switcheroo. So Rob ran for city council and Doug ran for mayor. And we walked up Islington to the, the Ford headquarters. Um, and, and she was also pretty independent. She had some help. She was a gra Ryerson graduate, so she had some help from uh, her, her Ryerson cohort and had a few other kind of uh, political folk helping her, but really on her own, a really bare, um, bare bones campaign. And, and I know there's something about her walking in front of the, the Ford machine that was striking. Uh, one woman against the Fords. Uh, she lost, of course, uh, in Ford country. So I, w I went for walks with other folks and started thinking like, what is it about, what, what, what is Ford Nation? And, and this is one of the Ford Fests after they outgrew the um, parents' backyard. It got too big and it got too wild. This was a Ford Fest in, uh, in Scarborough, in, uh, in Thompson Park. There were th maybe four or 5,000 people there. Um, and, and there was this archetype for a long time of what, what a Ford Nation person was. It was a person from the suburbs. Uh, it was often some kind of old, uh, often kind of vaguely or overtly racist white person. Uh, and when you went to a, a Ford Fest, those people were certainly there. Uh, you could hear it, you can hear the, the homophobic uh, uh, cat calls and, and sometimes people got roughed up. Um, it, was a very, it was very physical, these parties. Um, but, but also, they were also kind of beautiful because everyone else was there. So the actual crowd that showed up uh, for Ford Fest um, was as diverse as Toronto. So while some of that was the motivation for, for uh, appeal, Ford's appeal, it was also confounding because everyone else was there. So it, it defied an easy sum up. Um, and uh, they were actually really emotionally hard events to go to, the big Ford Fest, um, because you'd have the Ford brothers, you know, pontificating and saying all the stuff that they were usually saying. Uh, you had people yelling uh, uh, supportive things, sometimes nasty things, but then all these other people there that, that, that made it uh, confusing. What, what was it about these people that seemed like good people, uh, that were most definitely good people? What was it about Ford that appealed to them? And I, I got to realize that it was the, uh, and it, it's, it's a common story now. Uh, as I was finishing writing this book um, last summer, Brexit was happening and Trump was rising. And I'm writing about Ford over the last four years, especially the last two years. And it was the weirdest feeling of deja vu, of, of people feeling like they were left out of, of something. And there was something about Rob Ford, the same way there was something about Trump and there was something about Brexit, like giving the finger to the establishment uh, that, that, that appealed to people uh, and appealed to this really wide uh, swath of people. Um, so I realize, I'm going back to my hometown now, to Windsor, um, that we don't pay enough attention to City Hall uh, is, is, is a general thing. There's a, a saying that um, if, the, uh, if the federal government was to stop, we might not notice for a month. If the provincial government stopped all its functions, we, it might be a, a week uh, before we figured out. Maybe you guys, because you are paid provincially, would know earlier, uh, but this is kind of the general saying. And, but if City Hall stopped, uh, we would know within a matter of minutes because lights would flicker, the water would stop, the garbage would p pile up. Um, city Hall, uh, the city municipal level of government has the most effect on our daily life and 
yet it has the least amount of attention paid to it. Uh, it has the lowest voter turnout, like I said. And I, I grew up in Windsor. I, I, I did two degrees in political science, undergrad and grad school, um, and I never went into this building. I it overlooked my own city hall. I looked at, you know, I was into political theory and mostly looking at federal, international, sometimes provincial, all the sexy stuff, you know, where like there's intrigue and power. Um, and I'm embarrassed and I feel like I have to make amends for that for the rest of my life that I, I, I didn't go to my own city hall. It was only until I moved to Toronto after grad school where I met a bunch of people who were uh, fascinated with the place that kind of dragged me into um, the city hall here. Um, so, and, and there was something I think about Windsor uh, that uh, in its proximity to Detroit and its relationship with Toronto that really um, kind of caught me early, why I was fascinated with cities since I was a little kid. Um, you know, Windsor has this front row view of Detroit, which is this great city, rich city, beautiful architecture that if at Windsor got to see decline and, and kind of fall apart, which was heartbreaking, but also kind of hooked me into like that excitement of city, like that endless possibility, the onion, you could keep peeling and finding stuff, just like in the strip malls. Um, and, and, and that was happening there, and then up our version of, I don't know, New York, uh, you know, the capital where all the media comes from, Toronto, uh, was this like shiny emerald city uh, four hours away up the 401 where we would come to Toronto on trips and, you know, there'd be streetcars and subways, this electric nervous system, there were people on the street endlessly. Um, so being in between these two places made me really fascinated about like the excitement of cities. Yeah, I never went to City Hall. So I was, I, I love cities. And I was in, into politics, because it's what I studied, but I still overlooked City Hall, which I only realized when I was writing this book how much of a hole that was in my life and how much of a hole it is into other people's lives. So um, I think that's how Ford Nation snuck into our lives in Toronto, because we, we it, it's so obvious in front of us, but it's so easy to overlook that level of municipal politics because it almost seems like it doesn't matter because it's about service delivery. It's about potholes and street signs and all the stuff that's so easy to overlook, but stuff that people care about because it's on their corner and it has this emotional connection to. Um, and I think in Toronto, uh, sorry, in Canada in general, we tend to overlook our cities. Um, if you think of all the mythology, traditional mythology of uh, can lit over the last 40, 50 years, um, the things that were celebrated tend to be the Rockies or, you know, being alone in the, in the wilderness on the prairies or, or Peggy's Cove and all this kind of landscape stuff because we have so much of it. It dominated the mythology. Um, city stories, uh, city life wasn't really part of, of, of that narrative. Um, it's changing a lot lately. Um, but, uh, but, but, but the, the kind of the, 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 that mythology I grew up with in high school, we very rarely talked about cities and watched NFB films. Um, if you go to the NFB website, which you can watch a lot of the old films for free, so many of them are about wilderness, so little of them are about cities. And if it is about a city uh, in the 60s, 70s, and maybe the 80s, it tended to be Montreal or somewhere else. They tried to ignore Toronto uh, because of the usual, you know, we all hate Toronto in the rest of Canada. Uh, but we have these fantastic cities, and most Canadians live in cities, something like 80%. Um, so there's this um, cognitive dissonance between how Canadians actually live day to day and the the mythology of the place where we, we, where we think about landscape. And landscape is great. I like to go into it and then retreat back into an air-conditioned house at night um, or, 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 or civilization at night. Um, but but uh, that day-to-day that -day life is just kind of left out. Um, and Canadian cities, I think, are, are, are pretty interesting when, when, uh, when, you c when you kind of add them up that uh, our, our cities punch uh, above their weight. You know, we we've had three Olympics in the last uh, 50 years and two expos, all these kind of like marquee events that like cities and mayors like to check off because they're because they're mega festivals. Uh, we have big festivals that people seem to love. TIFF, the Montreal Jazz Festival, Carabana here. Uh, we Canadian cities have some of the biggest prides in the world. Uh, Toronto certainly is, I think, in the top three biggest prides. Uh, in, in, in the world, but then the Vancouver Pride's massive, Montreal Pride is massive. The, the, the size of these festivals, there's cities of comparable size and elsewhere in North America or even Europe um, that would love to have that. And, and our cities are always on these lists, you know, like I think as one came out today, uh, Toronto is the third most safest city in North America or the world. Like endless lists of being the best at something, livability, investment potential, and all that, and often have dubious um, methodology, but there's something going on in Canada 
Canada that we, we, we are getting in on these lists and yet we don't really appreciate uh, cities so much. Um, and there's a, lot, there's a few themes that go through the cities. They tend to be uh, inclusive. Uh, they tend to be, the Canadian cities tended to avoid things like white flight and um, the things that plagued American cities. Uh, by and large, uh, most Canadian cities are walkable, uh, very neighborhood driven. Um, access to nature, that, that landscape really snakes its way into it, uh, every city from the mountain in Montreal to the peninsula surrounded by the water in Halifax, Vancouver of course, the ravines in Toronto and we're on the beautiful Humber River uh, ravine and Arboretum here. Um, I think a lot of American cities and other European cities don't have, you can't really walk a couple blocks and get the amount of nature you can in Canadian cities. Um, and of course, uh, cities are idea generators and problem solvers. So it, 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 it's this dissonance that I find quite interesting in, in, um, in, in, in Canada. Uh, we used to have a, a poet laureate, some of you might have followed, uh, I think it was two poet laureates ago, Pier Giorgio de Ciccio. He was a um, cigarette smoking, turtleneck wearing Catholic priest. Uh, and he would still tell mass somewhere down in Mimico. Um, but he wrote a book, uh, kind of his legacy project for his years. He was under the Miller years, um, called The Municipal Mind. It's a, it's a, a kind of really long poem about the city um, and about how it's, it's, it's like, it's, 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 it's as if a poet wrote a wonk book, uh, you know, like an urban planning book, uh, which is, a, and I think it's still in print, so it's a wonderful thing. I have my students read it, or parts of it. Um, but he had this great line, a city is a poem in progress. Citizens are the author of the poem, uh, which is very utopic, of course, and maybe even a little bit Pollyanna. Uh, but I really like that, that kind of, th that ethos that uh, can maybe harn pull more people in to, uh, to, to civic politics um, and, and making their city, um, making their city better and, and, and trying to get over some of the stuff that we uh, had with the Rob Ford years. So um, I really like walking cities. So um, a, a lot of the book is about uh, walking through neighborhoods with these uh, folks. Um, and I, I, I think you have to walk your city to, to really know it. Um, if, if you just drive it, even if you transit, it, and even bicycles go a little bit too fast. And, and some of the kind of more, I don't know, theoretical or, or literary figures that have influenced me and are, are one is the, uh, the flaneur, which is this character that came out of um, France, Paris in the, in the mid 1800s. Baudelaire fashioned himself a flaneur, this kind of idle drifter who walked through the crowds and observed as a writer, as a person that studies cities, it's a really kind of interesting uh, role to kind of see yourself in. And um, it, it, it's, a, it's a good observer, participant, but always, um, always a little bit on the edge. It gets criticized for uh, a, a number of reasons, rightly. Um, it tends to be much easier for a white male to kind of be invisible in a crowd. You're not anyone's gaze uh, singled out in any way. Um, but the, the idea is changing and other people use it in different ways. This is a book that came out last year uh, called Flaneuves. Uh, uh, Lauren Elkin wrote it, she lives in Paris, uh, and so she wrote about the history of women walking cities, which I really like. It's expanding that notion of using this as a tool to understand the place you live. Um, as I was exploring Toronto after I moved here, I bought this book uh, from 2000 uh, by Rebecca Solnit, Wanderlust. It's still in print as well. Um, she's quite famous now for inventing mansplaining and writing the book uh, Men Explaining Things to Me. Um, and, and being just a general uh, public intellectual from the West Coast. Uh, but she had this great book about, about walking, about just walking cities and discovering things peripatetically. And her, one of her lines was, cities move at the speed of walking, uh, which I think she pegged around three miles per hour. And it, 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 it's at that speed you can really get that intimacy of, of, of hearing, overhearing things, smelling things, seeing things. Uh, without having to worry about being too fast uh, and, 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 and looking out ahead. You get to actually look at the thing that's around you, uh, which is why going for these walks was so valuable. Um, and the other kind of pseudo-scientific, uh, philosophical approach to cities that I like is, is psychogeography. Um, and with a bunch of friends, I started this psychogeography society, which is not a real society, uh, when I first moved here. But we would go for Thursday night walks. Um, riffing off what uh, the French situationists did in, in Paris 
back in, um, in, in the 50s and 60s, especially in, during the kind of Charles de Gaulle era, they were all, the situationists were all uh, radical Marxists and, and, and wrote treaties and, and everything else. Uh, but they did some fun things, like they would go for a walk through um, uh, Paris using a map of London. So they'd intentionally try to get lost because they saw everyone getting into their, well, I think you mentioned it, you get in your little lines, we, get, we all get in our little lines, homework, uh, our friends we know, and, and they almost become like these well-worn paths through the city, and it's really hard to break out of that. So we would go for um, uh, drifts, which the psychogeographers called derives. We would just drift through the city on Thursday nights and, and discover things, um, and, and that kind of ethos worked its way into this book, too, as a way, and continues to, uh, as I discover Toronto. The more I discover about Toronto, the more I realize there's um, things I don't know. Uh, so walking really helps you understand the shape of your place. One day I was back home in Windsor driving uh, by the Chrysler plant. If you own a minivan or if you've seen a minivan, Chrysler minivan, uh, this is where it's built, uh, by this plant. A plant I probably drove by once or twice a week my entire life before I moved here. And I, I was struck and I pulled over by how big it was. Um, I couldn't get my head around how, how big it was. Um, because because I had been living in Toronto, I think for eight years at the time, and I didn't really drive here. I lived downtown, uh, and I walked everywhere. I understood how things were shaped by walking. Whereas Windsor, I drove every day. It was a car town. Um, and so what I did is I, I walked around the the Chrysler plant, uh, and which I found out was big, uh, as I, as I, as I could see. But I didn't know how big. And I tweeted this picture out to uh, just tweeted it out, going, "Hey, Toronto people," because I, I think I was mostly Toronto. Uh, people that followed, and I said, look how big this plant is. This is where your minivans are made. Um, and, and a geographer friend of mine uh, had like a little light bulb go off, and he, via Google Maps, took the, uh, the, sh the, the footprint of the Chrysler minivan plant in, in Windsor and overlaid it in Toronto. And so it would go from Front Street almost all the way up to Bloor Street there. The, the, um, the oval is Queens Park. Um, and, uh, and that was like, I can understand what that is like, because I've walked down Young Street, uh, or I've, I, I know what five subway stops feels like, you know, I know that length of time. Whereas when you're in your car, it was all kind of blurring and it was abstract, and it was only the walk, or associating the size of that building with something that I knew via walking um, really, really made me understand the, the size of it and the, and the shape of the city and how much of a, of a, a, a thing it meant uh, to Windsor. Um, just in terms of its built form. So um, I, I work on a lot of things uh, that uh, are about actually kind of liking the city. When I, I write a column in the Toronto Star, uh, which gets complainy sometimes. Sometimes I, I get to complain about things, uh, sometimes too much probably. Uh, but also I get to write about what's good. And I try to balance between, I, I'll, I'll say to my editor, I think I'm going to have a happy column this week. And I'm going to go out and explore a ravine or some neighborhood um, or some interesting building. Um, and then I'll go back to complaining about uh, bike lanes or, or Tory or something. Um, and, and I think you have, to, you have to give people reasons why, um, why, why the place is worth fighting for. As much as uh, as much as critiquing it and complaining about it, and with our our, our magazine spacing, uh, I'm gonna skip over this. I've worked on a few things that were kind of celebrating um, the stories of Toronto, as well as the the built form. Um, these kind of houses that were uh, archival pictures that uh, changed over time. Uh, but spacing. Uh, which is our magazine that we started in 2003, um, tries to both celebrate the urban form and critique it at the same time. And uh, we, uh, we stumbled upon this interesting idea of making subway buttons. And uh, it was about 2006. We were three years into doing spacing. Starting a magazine in Canada or anywhere probably now is a bad idea. Uh, it's a way of opting out of the middle class. Um, and so we needed to do something that would help the mag magazine break even at least, help us pay our printing bills. Um, and, and we thought, well, let's make, let's make buttons for the subways, because one, one of us was a graphic designer, Matt, uh, who has taught here in the journalism program uh, at Humber. And, um, and he's, he's, he's adept at, uh, at Adobe Illustrator. And so he, he, fa he kind of 
did a facsimile of the, um, the tile patterns in all the subway stations, and they're all unique. Some of them on the bluer line are, are more, they look similar, but they're all kind of different. They have different color patterns, and, and they actually kind of match each other on the Danforth and on Bloor in this strange kind of almost mathematical way. Um, but we made these buttons and we sold them at our events, our, our magazine launches and the other things we did and we thought it would be a fun trinket to, um, to, to uh, you know, maybe bolster our, our bottom line. And they became really huge in the last, I guess, 10 years. We probably sold, I think, I don't know what the number is now, but something like five or 600,000 of these buttons. Um, and we expanded to Montreal as we opened blogs there and, and we did old like, old crests of towns that had been amalgamated into Toronto in the past, like Forest Hill and East York and that sort of thing, Swansea. Um, and it really was another kind of light bulb of, uh, we, need to, we need to celebrate the city. Um, we need to give people a reason to love it, to a reason to uh, uh, fight for it. I think you mentioned also your uh, Humber being lovable, huggable, huggable. You have to kind of make your, and this sounds wavy gravy um, and, and you know, a lot of people might make fun of this, um, you know, cynical media types, but I think you have to give people a reason, show, show off the city, show why it's worth fighting for, um, and, people, and people will uh, kind of fall in love with the place, even an ugly place like Toronto that's not traditionally be beautiful. And, um, you know, we'd have stories of, you know, parents as their kids got old enough to ride the subway, they'd, they'd pin um, they'd pin their home station on it so they'd know where to get off and, and kind of these nice cute stories. Um, and, and in our, st we, we opened a shop, uh, we sold these bunko. This was a, we made these buttons after um, uh, Don Cherry, you know, inaugurated Rob Ford and he said, downtown pingos, your time is done. So we made these and sold $20,000 worth of them before the Christmas in 2010. Uh, so we bought a couch for the office. Uh, thanks to Rob Ford. So Rob Ford actually helped some economies, uh, some local economies. Um, so we were able to kind of do silly things like this. Uh, and we started selling, trying, just starting to make things. Like this was the old Badashu uh, Museum, uh, museum, the old headquarters where the uh, Egg Econ Museum is now, uh, which was this cool modernist building. We sold t-shirts of it and we sold the, the, the buttons online. Um, and and uh, we were like, oh, there's, there's a market for this sort of thing. And so we opened the shop down at 401 Richmond, Richmond and Spadina, um, about two years ago, and selling stuff we make. Uh, and then all this other kind of stuff that all these other uh, independent, mostly um, uh, artisans are making. Some people make hats, uh, and, and these are uh, coasters made out of an old map of Toronto, more coasters out of old maps. Um, these are kind of woodcuts of maps, contemporary maps. Uh, more coasters, there's a lot of drinking, um, made out of the um, uh, subway tokens and some of the utility hole covers, um, dog chains, uh, Barkdale, somebody bakes Barkdale bones for dogs, um, pillows that are kind of Toronto keychains, uh, more t-shirts, pillows, lots of books about Toronto, there's soap, you can buy Junction soap, uh, Garrison Creek soap, which is the Berry Creek, Bellwood soap, Parkdale soap, I thought these would this was dumb when when the, we were started selling this. I'm going. I said to Matt, "Why are we selling it? like this? Is dumb soap? This is over the top. This is a little too Portlandia." Um, and and people love this stuff. They like buy like they tons of this. So I don't know anything about capitalism, um, but but I do know that people really have this great affection for this place. And so my feeling is that if we want people to um, get involved with that political side, you also have to give them the um, uh, the lovable side, the huggable side. And uh, with, with Frontier City, um, I think that's what I tried to do. I walked through, we walked through the ravines, we, walked, we met some beautiful people and had beautiful moments, but we also had some really ugly moments. Um, and and all, all that stuff is still here. Uh, John Tory was elected in 2014 um, with, a, with a fairly sizable majority. Um, he is, uh, he's very, he's kind of like Rob Ford in that he's a rich white guy, but he's an incredibly boring rich white guy, which is, I think, for a lot of people um, who are only vaguely involved in city politics thinks that's what Toronto needed. We needed just to calm down and chill out. Um, you know, but it could be argued that, you know, from a policy perspective, maybe they're not that much alike, Rob Ford and, and uh, John Tory. We don't like paying taxes and, and all that sort of thing, but I don't want to get 
uh, too political. Um, but so I think it's very easy in these last four, three years now, as the as the 2018 election ramps up, to lull ourselves into th going back to me when I was living in Windsor and ignoring City Hall or. or um, if there was any upshot of Rob Ford, it's that it energized a lot of people who had never been involved in any sort of civic thing before. Um, people started groups. Um, if you remember when Rob Ford uh, attacked the library, all over Toronto, downtown and the suburbs, it was kind of this wonderful, you know, cross that valley between the downtown and the suburbs, people rose up and defended the libraries and the Fords backed down. This was like a year in when uh, they, they, the first kind of, kinks in, in, in their what seemed like an indestructible machine started showing up. And then there was the, 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 f the famous um, uh, Ferris wheel out in the Portlands. Uh, and there was an incredibly big grassroots uh, citizen effort that rose up to defend the plan for the, uh, the, the Portlands that had been put into, uh, that had 10 years of consultation that Waterfront Toronto did. Um, and so there were a lot of people that participated in that and felt like they had ownership in it. And then other people that just uh, saw some potential for the place and didn't want the mall and uh, and Ferris wheel. So it pulled a lot of people in, but I think a lot of those people, some of them stayed for sure active and, and, and did different things, but it was very easy to kind of drift back. So when I was writing this book, Frontier City, I thought about 2018, even though it was a book um, on the ground in 2014. Um, and, and when it came out in February, uh, last February, um, not much had changed, I, it seemed. Like there, the, um, those divides were still being played with, the downtown versus suburbs, um, and other things like that. So uh, I hope the book is a way of uh, understanding this year, it's gonna be a terrible, endless year of uh, uh, the election. The election lasts like you know American presidential length, um, maybe without as good speech writing sometimes. Um, and, and but at the same time, kind of show why it's worth fighting for, why it's huggable. Um, I think a lot of people in Toronto, um, because the rest of Canada hates it, because the NFB didn't make enough films about it, um, because because it's a bit shabby looking in, in Parisian terms, um, it's uh, it's as much as other people don't like Toronto or, or that, or that um, that cliche, um, you will never find anyone run down Toronto more than an actual Torontonian. Um, so I feel like uh, we need to kind of work to pull people in uh, to the beauty of the place, whether it's the ravines, whether it's the people, um, and then hook them with the politics. Uh, so that's what I hope is what next, is that um, the, 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 the lovableness of Toronto, um, the, the reason for fighting for it, uh, is, is as much a part of, I don't know, civic, civil discourse as the actual you know, political uh, mobilization of people just caring about their local ward races and going to those meetings and, um, and, 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 and that sort of thing. So maybe I'll end there and if you want to talk about Toronto and uh, maybe tell me about your students. Uh, what I really love to do, I teach downtown at U of T, uh, St. George campus, two uh, classes on civics. Um, and we use the city as the laboratory where I take them out on field trips. Last week we went to uh, a ravine, the Vale of Avoca at Young and St. Clair with an arborist to talk about the urban forest. Next week we're going down Graffiti Alley, um, uh, south of Queen Street, to talk with a with a graffiti historian to talk about public art and that sort of thing, um, and a, and uh, I hope uh, that they become uh, hooked into the city and 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 go out and and uh, you know do good things. But but what I really like is that they are from all over the city. You know, they're pulled. Some of my students, you know, have two hours of commute from you know Aurora or or Brampton down in, but they bring all these wonderful perspectives into the place. And I wish that the, uh, the kind of wider political, the kind of mainstream political discourse had as many um, uh, wonderful views on the city and often non-cynical views that um, our classrooms do. So I'm gonna stop talking now. Thanks. Sorry, I stopped on a, a maple leaf. It's, well, I guess they're doing good this year, so it's not depressing. <laughs> Just you wait. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm using this fabulous microphone here so that you can know that if you have a question for Sean, you too can come and use this fabulous microphone so that people watching on the live cast or in future watching the video can actually hear what you have to say. So please, if you have a question, come on up and ask it. 
I just want to ask one question before I turn it over to other people. Uh, recently, uh, Doug Ford announced that he's running for mayor, and he trotted out all the usual rhetoric about the gravy train and taxpayers being jobbed and so on. And recently, too, Giorgio Mamaliti led a protest against the creation of three new wards to compensate for the fact that an enormous population has moved into the condominium area of downtown. Do you think these kinds of movements, these populist movements, still have legs? Or do you think there was something about Rob Ford alone? Something that means that we don't have to, well, I don't want to sound dumb. We don't have to be as scared of Doug Ford. We can take him on in a rational way, in a way that it was very difficult to take uh, his brother on in a rational way. Yeah, I think so. I think that Doug Ford is not a lovable guy. Um, he doesn't have the natural charisma that Rob did. Rob, you know, Rob was this said the most vile things um, about basic, but uh, every group. But he was still this kind of tragic character that you almost felt empathy for. Like when he got canned, when when the Catholic school board canned him from his football job, like the one thing that seemed to make him happy, like being mayor didn't seem to make him happy. It felt like the family pushed him into that. But when he coached hockey, he like he like screwed off from city council meetings. He's the mayor to coach football. You know, at, at, at up here at, on Islington, um, at Don Bosco, and uh, that he seemed like an actual. So when he was, he lost that thing, the one thing that made him happy. Uh, this poor guy that seemed to be bullied by his big brother, um, you kind of felt something, and I, that bothered me. That you know, I would feel instant kind of you know empathy for him, and um, and and I don't think Doug engenders that. Uh, he he doesn't have that natural you know, uh, charisma. But then again, you know, I don't think, tr I think Trump is a very Doug-like character, right? There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing that, you know, you feel bad about, about Trump, and yet, and yet he won. So, so I think, yes, I, I'm with you, but then I'm spooked, right? Because, uh, you know, I see all these other things happening. So, but I think we can have a rational, you know, um, uh, uh, kind of response to it. Um, the, the, the trick is that, I think right now the race is only between, and it's still pretty early. You're actually not allowed to declare you're running until May 1st now, I think. It used to be Jan January 1st, but they pushed it this time, uh, which is kind of good and bad, so it won't be as endless. It would be six months versus um, 10. But at the same time, if it's shorter, it's harder for um, another candidate to bump out the incumbent. So, um, And that, and that uh, applies to the council levels as well. Um, so it'll be a bit shorter. But uh, but right now it's just it's just Doug and and Rob and sorry Doug and John Tory I can't I get my white men mixed up um, uh, rich white men um, and, and and they're not that different they're both kind of hanging out here on the right of the center one a little bit more so it's like this battle there and and I know in the background there's a lot of um, uh, parties not necessarily political parties but groups uh, civil society groups looking for a candidate I know a number of media people uh, have, that have been approached um, but who have declined people like Jennifer Keysmat has been approached and she doesn't want to do it this year um, there was Peter Slawley who used to be the deputy police chief got kicked out because he wanted to reform the police department a little too much um, he's been asked uh, he was like a a kind of center, center left contender, but he doesn't want to do it. His kids are too young, he said. Um, so there's still a lot of people searching in the background for some somebody else to pull it in from the other side. So it's it's it seems like a battle right now of of kind of the same, you know, which which will make a rational, um, which I, which I think will make it a little less dramatic, right? If these two guys are, are going up and the incumbent has so much momentum, though the Fords. Fords are almost incumbent because their name is as recognizable as, as as John Tories, or maybe even more. And name recognition at the municipal level is is everything. You know, like I see that name. How many times have I I pay attention to this stuff, and in my ward, forgot to look at the TDSB candidates and just say, oh, that name looks familiar, um, and just kind of X'd it out because nothing bad happened. Um, so it's really and, and that, that's how you know people are busy. So you only have this limited limited uh, spectrum of, of time to get into people's heads. Yeah. John. Do you uh, agree with the critique that for all its qualities, which we could all agree on, I think, uh, Toronto has long been fundamentally mismanaged politically, the nub of which is that there was never a good cohesive approach 
between the city and the province for regional planning, leaving us with evident current problems with public transit, which it seems to be decades behind uh, traffic and, and so on. That we, you know, we were growing these, these suburbs, which in fact have become cities of 600,000, Markham, Mississauga, Thornhill, and so on, right? Yeah. You, I, I, are you on board with that view? Yeah, pretty much. And there's been, and so many good decisions are are overturned historically here because of politics. Like there, right now, we there's the Scarborough subway, which which may or may not get built, um, still, uh, which replaced all the nice LRTs that would have come to our front door here. Um, and and so that that fight is ongoing. But that fight goes all the way back to. Bill Davis era when he, instead of extending the, sh the subway that we have past um, Warden Victoria Park Kennedy, uh, instead of extending that, just changing technology and getting the, the funky space shuttle cool uh, SRT because it was made in Ontario technology. Um, and, and that was a political decision that has, you know, 35 years later ramifications. So yeah, good planning because of that dynamic between the province, cities being the child of the province, uh, unlike American cities where they have a little bit more autonomy. Um, the, the, the it's, it's not just the politics of the city that can screw things up, it's the politics of the province. There was a great quote from Lynn McLeod, who used to be the uh, liberal leader, I think the provincial liberal leader maybe 10, 15 years ago, maybe more. Um, and she said, I cannot do for Toronto what I can't do for Wawa. Um, which is great. Like Wawa is, is fine and good, but it's tiny, and it's 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 in, it's in the north, which is a whole other part of Ontario, and yet those dynamics of doing too much for Toronto, when you have to serve the rest of the province, who deserves serving, um, throws this place out of whack, a lot. While you're pillaring rich white men, don't forget Art Eggleton, who sold the waterfront and created a concrete curtain there uh, that we have never finished overcoming, I, I would say. Yeah, I think that, I, I wasn't here for that. Uh, I got here in 2000, um, but it, I, I find it that that kind of, the cynicism around the waterfront is so strong that even, like now it's it's arguably quite a nice place. Um, the newer developments, the, the music garden going towards the airport and, and what's going to come past Chorus Key. Um, it, you can actually, pr except for like where this ferry is and a couple other places, you can pretty much walk along the water. Uh, and there's lots of people there now, there's grocery stores. Um, it's, it's, it's almost a 24-hour neighborhood, uh, but there's still that kind of baked-in cynicism because of that 1980s era when that, that kind of central chunk, that central kind of ugly chunk uh, went up. Um, well, and still a lack of public transit, parking, uh, I mean, there some of those complaints still pertain. Yeah, yeah, for sure. It's hard to, uh, it's really, what I like about my job, uh, my fake job of getting to go and write about things, uh, and I often get to go out on different commutes, you know, to get to places all over the city, and I, you get to see how other people, the things that people deal with that you can easily overlook, um, and something like, like uh, just how, how impossible it is to move around the city now, um, and how uh, how far far in the future any transit solution seems to be, and again the cynicism of it, um, you can understand why people vote for something like a subway because a subway they can picture it that will get me there and back. LRT is this wonky term uh, that uh, that was spoiled. Rob Ford called them trolleys, and people had this vision of you know like King Street rather than an, a proper LRT. So um, there's just the why it's so interesting and exciting, I think, the, the municipal level, because there's all this institutional memory that everyone has and carries with them into every election, um, and a lot of it is cynicism built on other things before. Um, so you talked a lot about the distinction between downtown and the suburbs, and what is Toronto and what's not. And uh, back in the day when I was just a lad, um, Gary Loutons, the columnist in the Toronto Star, used to say, unless you want to raise chickens, why would you live north of Eglinton? Um, do you think that line has moved, and do you think that line will continue to move, and if so, where? Yeah, well now you can raise chickens south of Eglinton, because <laughs> it's just funny. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, the line, 
th that imaginary line is kind of interesting, right? Like, like Uptown used to be Young and Eglinton, but Uptown is now um, uh, North York City Center, and Eglinton is Midtown. And anything south of Bloor is maybe downtown, right? It's because the that that spine, that kind, it's very Manhattan model of uptown downtown. Um, but that spine along um, Young Street, watching that thing expand, is really interesting. One of the most influential books on in, on my Toronto career has been um, Accidental City by Robert Fulford, uh, the columnist in National Post and, and Toronto Life and everything. He's about 85 now. But he wrote this book in 1995 called Accidental City, where it was very influ influential on this book um, about how the city planning just sort of, it just sort of happened, right? And all its greatness and all its horribleness kind of just, you've stumbled into it. Um, but uh, he talks about Olga Korper, uh, who runs an art gallery, which is on Morrow Street, which is like um, where Dundas is curving up towards Roncesvalles, just before that, after it goes over the tracks from Lansdowne. And he, this is 1995 or four he's writing, and he says, we got in a cab, because they were downtown where the art galleries used to be along Queen Street, and we took a cab far out <laughs> to like past Lansdowne on, on Dundas. And it's just like, wow, like that was far out. That's not far, like that's the middle now, right? So um, I'm waiting for, I think that line is just gonna keep like, as, and it's, uh, it's pushed by um, economy, obviously, where things are cheaper, and it's pushed by um, just the general pop. There's more people living in the city now. And, and that pushes the line out as people get to travel around more. Um, I'm gonna, I, I like, I'll see that, I, I imagine that line uh, is gonna go into the suburbs at some point soon, I think. Um, and I'm trying to like predict what's, and not in a Toronto life way, you know, the next hot neighborhood, but like what, what indie rock show or art gallery is gonna open in, I don't know, maybe Mimico or like the, the industrial neighborhoods just north of Mimico where it's they can probably find cheaper space, or Scarborough, um, like the Golden Mile, where there's all these industrial spaces. Mid-century ones, not the old wooden beam ones like downtown, which are uh, fashionable right now, but maybe that kind of bigger mid-century one will become in fashion in that, that built form. Um, but I think that's gonna happen soon. Like already when I, I go for these night bike rides, just kind of drifting through these um, endless industrial areas, uh, which have been deindustrialized a bit, and so you get these mega churches. So such interesting territory there, but also often in the middle of the night, you'll hear bands playing, like uh, in the middle of the night, midnight or 11 o'clock at night, because that's where cheap band space can be found. But it's not an event-driven thing. So I think that line will be pushing, and that's going to be really interesting when, when that kind of the tastemaker culture, uh, which drives a lot of you know media and everything else pokes into those neighborhoods, um, it's gonna be interesting. When we, we theme our spacing issues, and um, uh, a few years ago we had a suburbs issue, so we mostly we focus on the suburbs. Um, even though I, in the book I argue that the, our suburbs are actually the city, um, because people who live in here, people who live in Scarborough, don't see themselves as the suburbs, it's just the city. Um, and that's, I think, a lot of younger people view, view it that way. People who are old enough to remember pre-amalgamation have different views of it, but the, but the younger generation doesn't see those divides. Um, as much, and and we had us we had our suburban issues. So we were like, let's launch our let's have a magazine launch at in the suburbs somewhere um, because we usually have it at the Gladstone or the usual, usual downtown junk. Um, and we thought about it, thought about it, and and that was a big part of our revenue model. People would come, pay ten bucks, and we could pay off our printer for like the hundred people that showed up. Uh, it was it, if we didn't get those hundred people, we'd be a bit screwed. Um, we're a bit safer now. But um, uh, we decided not to. We said, we said our, our folks, our base, uh, are lazy. They're not going to go up uh, out into the suburbs. We are like, maybe we can have it in North York on the subway at, at like a legion, uh, you know, at like Shepherd and Young. And we're just like, no, no one's going to come. Everyone like is like, what? People complain about going across the Don Valley. Um, they're not going to, they're not going to come north. So, so that line's going to change, but it's so, people like will hold on tight as well. It's so it's, it's a really interesting tension, I think, to watch that thing kind of play out. And I think it might have political, um, uh, not ramifications, but, but it might affect politics because I think, I think part of Rob Ford's appeal was that the shiny city, that downtown with the cranes in the sky everywhere and the wealth and the culture, uh, endless art galleries, all the kind of like the, 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 the prosperous, sexy city, um, that that a lot of the city doesn't get to participate in on a day-to-day -day basis um, drove a lot of that kind of uh, that grudge that that Rob Ford was able to kind of pick at, and and if the culture that kind of whatever it is, mainstream you know zeitgeist tastemaker culture comes out, 
I wonder if it'll change. I don't know, maybe it won't, maybe it will. Fun lines to watch, yeah. Also why I love having students who, are, who live all over the region, um, because they, they, they talk, like their center of gravity is so different. You know, I grew up in the suburbs, but I live downtown now, and I, I wanna live downtown because like, I like, like it's like Batula Clark, I wanna you know, sing that song downtown. Um, but but you re students will like talk about their, their center of gravity almost like and, and downtown's not part of it. Like you know, they like they, they revolve around hubs like UTSC. This hub here, you know, when you stand in the parking lot and there's Viva buses and Zoom Zoom Zoom. I always say it wrong because of the umlaut. Um, you know, this is a whole other orbit and that's kind of that's like that's a new Toronto that's that is uh, is pretty exciting, I think, that there it's it has all these other orbits and mechanisms working across 905-416. Rambly answers here. So my question is about uh, some of the ideas you brought up, the huggable city, the livable city, and I'll take on the idea of the separation between the suburban and downtown. And the some of the questions I had was, number one, the separation between downtown and the rest, is it really a line between streets. When I talk to like contractors in the city and I've had conversations, they say, well, look at what our mayors have done. Look at what our city planners have done. There's a separation between downtown and the rest because look at where everything is. So all the great things you pointed out about Toronto, the TIFF Film Festival, the art galleries, the museums, the sporting events, the CN Tower, everything is literally within blocks of one another. So you go to the rest of the city and you literally have to find, well, what's there, right? And then you look at other things. So I remember, I think about when you mentioned other cities around the world. So uh, when I go to Paris, when I go to London, when I go to Rome, when I go to Spain, right? It's unbelievable the stuff you see in the city. And when people come to Toronto and I have to take them out, I really have to sit there for a while and go, where do I go? Do I go to Casa Loma? Do I take them to, like, where do I go, right? And I was at a talk a couple years back. Jaime Lerner came from uh, Curitiba, and he created this beautiful, sustainable city. And I think about these innovators that have changed their cities, that have created these landmarks that everyone from around the world wants to see, and the meta, what's going on in Medellin, and right, all these wonderful cities. And then I think back here, and when Jaime Lerner was here, and like, and there were ex-mayors there and city planners, and I was thinking, what did they show him? What did they show him and say, this is the amazing stuff you've done in Curitiba, this is what we've done in Toronto, what? Like, so my question in a sense is that, you know, downtown divide from the rest because everything was planned for some reason to be in these couple blocks. And have we really changed that? And what do we do moving forward, I guess? Moving forward, like what's next? How do we change that? What do we do about that? Toronto is a very hard city to market for like tourism Toronto because of those exact reasons. Like you can't keep flogging Casa Loma. It was kind of big. I think that's why they were happy like the, the aquarium came, you know? <laughs> but I think Toronto's, Toronto's charms are, are more subtle, like going for, a walk along Dundas or Queen or, or Bathurst or sorry or Bloor, these kind of east-west streets where you can walk 10 kilometers and it's solid retail with a couple breaks maybe, and you go through all these interesting neighborhoods. But that's not a traditional thing of marketing like the cluster of, of all, all these kind of wonderful things. Um, the, uh, the the part about everything, I, th I think the clustering of culture downtown is okay in, in one way because like it's you need that cluster, you need that kind of critical mass of being able to go and you could choose from big stuff like the AGO or the ROM or the dozens of little galleries that you could go to if you're into art um, or maybe sporting events or, or whatever. But um, I would like it if, if like during Nuit Blanche they tried to do a suburban Nuit Blanche, like, like the fourth area is Scarborough City Center or Somewhere on a, uh, I think it would have to be somewhere on a, a, a subway so people could get to it. But but then would it be like us with spacing? Like would would the people downtown, who are or or would people's usual travel patterns who come from outside and there's this natural thing where you go downtown for stuff to see the leaf to see whatever to see a show, um, would would that's disrupting like 
traditional traditional patterns that's disrupting where people live. Uh, but it would be an interesting experiment to to force it out, uh, force people to go out to see something like that there, to see if people go. I don't know. I don't know if people would go though. You know, people like the that the Petula Clark song just keeps coming up in my head. You know, nobody sang a song about the periphery. Right? It's like it's like downtown still kind of has this excitement of cluster and density, um, but but like I showed with the the, sh the the strip malls, the exciting stuff is actually in the suburbs or the or the outside of the inner city. Uh, the weekend is from Scarborough, right? He grew up in towers and hung out in strip malls, um, and when you that's where the good restaurants are, and and so when you walk through it, um, you know there's culture there, but it is a much more indie and independent culture. Then, then it's not as hooked into institutions that have bricks and mortar that you can kind of walk over and see. So it's there. It just, uh, it's just really, really hard to discover. And it's hard for marketing purposes, whether you're Tourism Toronto or you're arts tr or some sort of arts organization, um, because it's so diffuse. And just like the, the poverty and, and all these other issues are hidden up in the towers and in the built form, that post-war built form, either it's towers or it's behind the garage. Um, the uh, you know that kind of vibrant art scene is also takes a little extra step to find. So it's a it's got a few things stacked up against it. I think just the the traditional patterns of people used to going downtown. That's where stuff is, um, and and then the built form. You know that po pre war post war kind of thing. It's harder. It's harder to you know people have this idea of the art scene or e exciting city scenes being in a pre war you know like neighborhood strip rather than a post war one. I'm going to ask a question about the Flinner. Um, so I spent a lot of years in graduate school actually doing a lot of research on your work. And a group of us um, looked at the Flinner. We actually would call it Flannery as methodology. And so we were interested in um, using the Flinner or Flannery as a methodological approach to research and learning about your community and, and the people surrounding it. And it was supposed to be for um, elementary school children. And so we kind of piloted this project, and some of the big themes that came out were, um, you know, how you negotiate your identity depending on the spaces that you frequent. And another big one was this idea of technology now, um, kind of creating a barrier between people and the places that they're uh, walking through or occupying. And so one big thing that we talked about, and I would love your take on it, um, is this idea of as the Flunner kind of journeying through the streets, you yourself looking at, at people and how they interact with their space, now we keep seeing people not, they're physically in their spaces, but they're not really there in their mind. So they're not almost interacting with the spaces that they frequent, they're somewhere else because of the technology. And we had this question about, well, are we really occupying space if we're not really there? And how that kind of interjects with this idea of the flaneur and how much can we really um, capture from people and how they interact with space if they're not really interacting with that space? Does yeah. that make sense? It does, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because people worry so much about you know, this thing taking over and taking people away from that space, you know, like, it, like, like people worry about the demise of gay bars because you used to have to go to a gay bar to meet people. But now there's all these apps where, so you don't, you no longer need that kind of community, right? And there's other analogous communities that are, are facing, you know, their own challenges in that way. Um, there's actual, this is my amateur take because there's actual people who study this, you know, uh, quantifiably. But, um, but I'm a, I think I'm a little optimistic about it because I think about how I engaged with the city and it's, it's a combination of being physically there and looking around, but also this machine. Uh, when I was writing my first book, Stroll, which came out in 2010, mm -hmm. uh, I'd been on Twitter for two years. Um, first starting with the flip phone where you like type in the, the text and send it to Twitter and then I wouldn't see the responses until I got back home. Um, but I'd, I'd tweet through my walks for Stroll, which was a book about walking Toronto, uh, less political than this one. Um, and uh, I'd be like out in the hydro corridor and, and, and that sort of thing. And I'd get back and people would say, or sometimes it would, I think the mechanism was it would send you back a text, Twitter would text you back. And I'd see like, oh, you're at Cummer Road and uh, the hydro corridor in North York. Go around here and check this thing out. So I had this kind of interactive layer uh, where people 
kind of helped lead me around and told me what to look at, or sometimes told me if I was wrong, and that still happens today. Like my observations of places, I kind of pump out through Twitter. I pretend it's my, I think of it as my public notebook, um, which is kind of like a Flanner's tool, tool or something, mm -hmm. um, interactive notebook. And I really thrive on like the, 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 the feedback from people, like the added layers, the added history and context people give to me and, and, and telling me that I'm wrong and my, my take on something is wrong. Um, and, and just in, in a, aside from that, like sometimes I'll, I'll tag a picture to a condo or something just so I can pull up the, um, the, the condo's tag in, in Instagram or something like that. And then you can check that tag and scroll through hundreds and hundreds of pictures of any given condo or building, resident or, or rental building, it doesn't have to be a condo, um, but there's something about the lifestyle of condos that seem to, to, to encourage this sort of thing. Uh, and, and you get to have this voyeuristic view into everyone's um, uh, place because if somebody has like 50 followers or 100 followers, it's just their you know family, their friends that they like. But the moment they tag it geographically, it's open for anyone to see unless they have a closed account. Um, so you can, it, it's remarkable the amount of things you can see. So whereas before, I would just stand in front of the building and go, this is a building. Um, uh, and, and now I can stand in front of it or, or be at home and do it and just scroll through bedrooms and uh, the different costumes people wear um, and the weird things that people get up to and the totally boring things that they get up to and the horrible food that they eat, endless hor great food, horrible food, I'm just kidding. Uh, and it's this intimacy with the, the building that uh, I wouldn't get otherwise. So um, I worry about it, like I worry about uh, people that are GPS driven, who only follow their GPS and they've never had to use a real map. Um, and, and, they, and, and does that affect the way they understand the city if they've never had to look at a map and look around and, and only let the GPS tell them left or right? Like it, you get to turn off some of your brain. I do that now in the car and I get, I, it bothers me that I do it because it's so easy, but, um, but I just kind of shut off and I pay attention to the podcast or whatever I'm listening to. So I worry about it, but it also it opens up all this other these other doors. It also allows for serendipitous account encounters, like you know, like does does anyone make a plan uh, to meet someone at X time, like anymore? Well, people do obviously, but so many of my encounters with friends are like, well, we meet around here somewhere around this time, and we just text back and forth as we're mobile through the city, and ping each other. Whereas before, in the old days, 10 years ago, you had to make the plan and stick to it. I can't imagine doing that now. It's just not how I operate. I have one friend who defiantly does not have a phone and she's impossible to meet because I have to like stick to my plan to get there. And, uh, I, and, I, and I make fun of myself with her that I have to do this, but like my other social life is just is so kind of mobile. And, and I think that's kind of interesting too because we end up in interesting places sometimes that we wouldn't normally end up because we hear about things and let's go check this out. So that's a long, long answer of I don't know, but I'm optimistic mm -hmm. and worried at the same time um, because I've, I've, I've got, it's, it's made my writing better and it's made my exploration of the city better, um, but I can see how, how you can kind of get sucked in and then not pay attention to the city. Which was their biggest obstacle. The students couldn't wrap their brain around this idea of the Flanner separate from the technology, mm -hmm. even themselves as the research, the, the participant observers, right? Thank you. Yeah, it's interesting. The, we said about um, grade school kids. Like I was, I picture the the greatest flaneur was um, um, Billy from the Family Circus. You know, when they do that whole that <laughs> neighborhood montage and little Billy with his dotted line behind him, so you could see where he went. He went inside of windows and people's kitchens and under the under the milkman's legs because it was all nuclear family land. Uh, and and those were fascinating as a kid. Like look at that. Like the guy just wandered all over the place. Kids are good flaneurs without knowing it. Thanks. Let me just, let me just jump in one more time to say thank you again to our speaker tonight, Sean McAuliffe, did an excellent job. I really appreciate your talk. And to remind you all that we do have a reception set up on the side, so if you'd like to stay, grab a bite to eat, a cup of coffee, what you will, please help yourself. And those of you who are presenting tomorrow, I remind you again, we'll be open at 8.30 here, so if you need a place to get ready, come on down. See you.
There we are. Uh, Linnea Nord is here from Nelson, and she's going to have a small book fair on the tables back over there. So while you're eating, you may also like to drive by or walk by. Walking is a good thing to do, as we know, and have a look and chat with her. We're always glad to see her here. Thank you.